My weakness, his strength. My weakness, his strength. Can you say that with me? My weakness, his strength. Thank you, Jesus. I want you all to put your hands out in front of you. Everybody put your hands out in front of you. And I want you to think about all the things that make you weak today. All the things that make you weak. All those things that, all those buttons that you have that the enemy can press at any time and instantly get you discouraged and instantly make you sad and instantly take your joy and your hope. I want you to put it all in your hand right now. And I want you to call it my weakness. Look at it and say, this is my weakness. Or actually, if you're like me, you have more than one. So let's say, these are my weaknesses. Amen. Now, I want you to take those weaknesses, and I want you to lift them up. God, at the beginning of this message, I pray for these people. We are lifting up our weakness to you for a great divine exchange this morning, God. I pray that as we go through the motion of lifting up our weaknesses, God, that you will stir within us a great and mighty faith to cast our cares upon you. And then once we bring them down, bring them down, bring your weaknesses down, and they are gone. Open up your hands. Let me see your hands. All ten fingers, let me see them. And I want you to put all those ten fingers on your heart right now. God, thank you for making my weaknesses your strength. I am strong. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Compassion. Compassion means this. It's a feeling of deep sympathy and sorrow for another who was stricken by misfortune. But it is accompanied by a strong desire to alleviate the suffering. That's what compassion means, okay? It's a great sorrow for someone that you see is suffering, but it doesn't stop there. Compassion doesn't stop there. Compassion is an action, amen? And I just saw you sitting there. Did you want to go down or do you want to stay up? It's your call. That's a big responsibility, I know. Were you planning on going down? Okay, all the children, please come forward. All the children, please come forward. There are some parents rejoicing right now, like, yes. Woo. Thank you. All right. All the children, all the children, please come forward. All the children, please. Thank God for these children. Amen. All right. All right. God, I thank you for these children. I thank you for the message of encouragement that you have for them, Lord, even as children. I pray for their instructor, their teacher, God, that even though she might not be up here and even though they, that they might not be up here, God, your spirit abides in this place, God. I ask that you would dwell richly in our children. I thank you, Father God, that these children are going to grow up to be men and women of God. And they will serve you all the days of their lives, God. They might not understand everything that's going on right now, but that's okay, God. I just pray that we are doing your word, which is training up children in the way that they should go, so when they are old, they will not depart. Blessings upon these children and their instructors. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. All right. Back to compassion. And you guys are welcome to go down. There's snacks. There's snacks. <laughs> no, there's snacks. All right, here we go. Compassion. Can you say compassion? compassion? Now, compassion is when you see someone hurting and it doesn't stop there. That compassion moves on to action. Can you say action? So compassion is basically love in action, okay? What is compassion? Love in action. What is compassion? Love in action, okay? So that's what compassion is. And Matthew chapter 14, verse 14 says this, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them. What is compassion? Love in action. He was moved with compassion towards them 
and healed their sick. Okay, so we should know that if we are born again, if Jesus Christ is living on the inside of us, then we should have this love that does something. Okay, because Christianity talk is cheap, but Christianity action is awesome. Okay, and compassion is love in action. And Jesus Christ had compassion upon the sick, compassion on the broken, compassion on the hurting, compassion on the lost. And you know what? He needed them. Jesus Christ needed them. He needs broke people. He needs the sick people. He needs the hurting people. Why? Because he comes to deliver them. The word of God says this, that Jesus Christ, his whole mission was to destroy the works of Satan. What are the works of Satan? He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But why did Jesus come? I come that you might have life and might have life more abundantly. And we talked about the cross the cross on Wednesday night, and it doesn't look like a, 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 a minus sign. It looks like a plus sign, right? But if we take away the middle partition, it looks just like a minus sign, okay? And we know that that's what the devil came to do from the beginning, was steal from us, to destroy us because he hates us, because he hates God, because we are made in the image of God, amen? Now, Jesus Christ came from, from glory to earth. So starting at the top, he came all the way down, and he went right through that minus sign. He went right through the works of Satan. To destroy the works of Satan, he cut right through his plan. He cut right through, and it looks just like a cross. And Jesus was crucified on that cross to add to our lives. And not only to add to us so that we would not perish, not to just give us everlasting life, but he has come to give us life more abundantly. Meaning that after you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and as your God, you don't just die. You've got some life to live. So not only did he come to give you eternal life, but life more abundantly to help us to succeed in all the things that he would have us to do in this life. Amen? So, Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 13. And it came to pass, when he was in a certain city, and this is Jesus, behold, a man full of leprosy. How much leprosy did he have? He was full of leprosy. Who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him saying, Lord, if thou will, thou canst make me clean. And he put forth his hand and touched him saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. Now listen to this. A leper wasn't allowed to come within six feet of any other human, including his own family. The disease was considered so revolting that the leper wasn't permitted to come within 150 feet of anyone when the wind was blowing. Lepers lived in a community with other lepers until they either got better or died. The leprosy of modern times is sin. The, mess is, the, the, the leprosy of modern times is brokenness. All the things that the enemy comes to bring to our life to make us feel down, to cancel our joy, to uh, erase our hope, that modern leprosy, Jesus came to take it from us, amen? So here's this leper that came to him, okay? He was breaking all the rules by coming to Jesus. He was supposed to stay where he was. He was supposed to stay lost, stay broken, stay exiled. But he heard about a man named Jesus, and he brought his brokenness. He was full of leprosy. He said, look, I guess he made a decision that day. He says, look, I'm either going to get better or I'm going to die here. What do I have to lose? I want to live. They can't even be around their family anymore. They can't work anymore. They were exiled. And I want you to know that sin comes into our lives to exile us from the promises of God, to exile us from life eternally, amen? But we have to say, you know what? I do not receive this death sentence. I am going to push my way towards Jesus Christ, and my plea to him is this. Look, Lord, if you will. I'm not demanding anything. I desperately need a change. I desperately need you to help me, but I can't demand anything. So, Lord, if you will, would you make me clean? And Jesus said, I will. 
And then you know what he did? He touched him, a leper. He touched a leper. He came close to him, touched him, and took away his infirmity, and he was made whole. Amen? Listen to Psalms chapter 34, verse 18. It says this. The Lord is nigh or close to them that are of a broken heart. Have any of you ever been heartbroken before? I'm not talking about a man by, by a man or a woman, but possibly that, but just by life. Sometimes life can just break your heart. And it says this, the Lord is close to them of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. So that lets me know that Jesus is not attracted to the strong and to those doing well. You know why? He's already their strength. He's attracted to the broken, to the weak, to the desperate, to the crying, to the humble. Why? Because he loves us. It all boils down to love. He is ready to exchange our brokenness for his wholeness. Amen? But this is what we do because we've been taught this in this world. We've been taught that it's the survival of the fittest. So what do we do? We go to work. We wear this fake smile, right? We wear this fake smile. We go to uh, family functions. We wear this fake smile. We go to the grocery store. How are you today? Yeah, it's good to see you. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Because it is survival of the fittest in this world, and it's, it's shameful to appear weak. It is shameful to appear weak. So you know what we do? We hide our weakness. We hide our brokenness. And not just from each other, our biggest problem is we hide it from God. And still go through the motions like, we, 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 the, we allow the devil to beat us up so bad. Well, if you've got faith, then you should just be all right. Okay. Mm. And you try under your own power, and then you fall over again. Nothing can be done in your own power. God desires the weakness that we are hiding from him. God desires the brokenness that we are hiding from him. Because then, and only then, will there be a transformation. Say this with me. I cannot get myself together. We can't do it. We cannot do it. You cannot get yourself together. I don't care how many Oprah shows you watch. I don't care how many, how you change your diet. Or maybe I should detoxify. I don't care all these natural things that you try to do. There is nothing that can fix your brokenness except your ability to say, Lord, I am weak. Lord, I need your help. Lord, I am broken. And he is the one willing to exchange his strength for our weakness. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, casting all, how much? Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. He cares. He cares. He cares. He cares. He cares. So many times we think we must be bothering God or something. So many times we think that, oh, he has bigger problems and bigger issues. We are his issue. We are his problem, and he is asking that we bring his, our brokenness to him. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Now listen, the people that you've been talking to, I mean, they kind of care about you, but they can't help you. You know, some of you desire, oh, I just wish I had somebody to talk to. I wish I had somebody to talk to. Listen, talk to Jesus. Cast your care upon him because he cares for you. He's the one that was willing to touch the leper. So he is not afraid of your problem. He is not afraid of your issue. And he died for your sins. He didn't die because we had it together. He didn't die because we served him so well. God didn't, God didn't say, wait, I'm going to send you to save them as soon as they get themselves together. We would still be waiting. He said, I'm going to them while they were still in sin, that he sent his, his son for, to save us. Amen? Now listen to this. It says, cast all your care upon him. 
It doesn't say by him or around him, upon him. Do you know why? He cares that much to take your problem. He's not like the world. We'll hear somebody suffering, and this is our help. I'll be praying for you. Oh, thanks. I need some real help, you know? I'll be praying for you. That's not what Jesus did to the leper. He didn't say, the leper didn't come to him, leave the colony of lepers, leave all the people that were saying, unclean, unclean. I'm sure he heard that on the way to Jesus because that was what they would say in those days. The people would scream, unclean, 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 okay? So over all those screams, he didn't turn around. He said, I've made it this far. I've got to find this man, Jesus. I've got to find him. He's the only one that can help me. He's the only one that can heal me. He didn't say, if I could just make it to mom's house or if I could just see my wife and kids again. He said, no, I've got to find this man, Jesus. I heard he's raising dead people. I heard he's opening blind eyes. And if he can do that, if he can do that, then he can fix me. So I've got to go find him. Amen? We have to be able to cast our cares upon him. Why? Because he cares. He cares. Amen? But we say this. We excuse ourselves and say this. But Lord, I have leprosy. But Lord, I'm addicted to drugs. But Lord, I can't keep myself from watching these things on the computer. But Lord, this is what's wrong with me. But Lord, I've done so many sins. I'm so dirty, God. You definitely don't want to touch me. Oh, I'm so dirty, God. I've sinned against you so much. There is no way that you can receive me. And Jesus just stands there like this. Come unto me, all of you that are heavy laden, and I, I will give you rest. So the only person stopping us is us. The only person stopping us is us. Now listen. If I said on next Sunday, if I made an announcement, and I said on next Sunday, your pastor will be standing here, and what I want you to do, I want you to bring me all of your bills. Bring me all of your bills, and I'm going to pay them, because I care for you. Okay? How many of you would not put a bill in here? Not very many. You'd be digging up old bills, checking your credit report. Mm. Okay, yep, this was 1982. I forgot to pay this. You'd put it all in, right? That's what Jesus is asking from you. Put it all in. Your whole mess, everything that's wrong with you, put it all in. Because you know what? He knows our secrets. The things that we hide so well from each other, he knows all of those things. And he's saying, put them in. Cast your cares upon me. I care about you. Put them in. Because you know why the message is so urgent? Why the cry is so urgent? Because he doesn't want us to die in sin. He doesn't want us to die broken when he is available to fix us. Can someone say amen? Thank you, Jesus. He will come when no one else will come close. It is Jesus alone. But why? Why does Jesus like to use broken things? Why is Jesus attracted to those things which are shunned by everybody else? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 25 through 31 read this way. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, talking about us, do you see your calling, brothers and sisters, how that not many wise men after the flesh, okay, not many mighty, okay, not many noble or called, all right? So if we look around the room, there's not many mighty in the flesh. There's not many wise in the flesh. There's not many noble in the flesh, okay? So that's not who the call went out to, all right? So what is it, who are you calling then? But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world. I'm a foolish thing. We are foolish things, amen? We have been fornicators. We have been alcoholics. We have been liars. We have been cheaters. We have dabbled with things we should have never dabbled with. We have ran from God. We have been full of lust, full of pride. And I'm just talking about me. I'm just talking about me, okay? So if God can call me 
out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know what? That's the beauty of it. That's why God calls the broken. That's why God calls the lame. That's why God calls us because it brings glory to the Father that Jesus can present us to the Father and say, remember him? Remember the one that was a liar and a cheater? Remember the one who wouldn't serve us with all of his heart? Look at him now. He finally casted his cares upon me. He finally brought his problems to me. He finally surrendered. And now he is not walking in his own pride or in his own strength. Now he is walking in our strength. That's why God calls the foolish things. Amen? The world would never hire us in that condition. They want to call the things that are at the top, but that's, that is not what God does, okay? He's chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of this world and the things which are despised have God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught things that are. Why? Why does God call the broken? Why does God call the weak? It says this, that no flesh should glory in his presence. That once, we, once Jesus touches us, once Jesus cleans us up, we won't be able to say, look what I did. That's why he calls the weak, so that we can stand in his strength, so that we can give a testimony to say, you look at me now. That's why I'm so transparent. That's why I, I, I tell you what I used to be involved with. I tell you what my past sins were and my transgressions were. And every time I do that, it knocks me down and brings him up. It knocks me down and brings him up because it is a, the glorious miracle. It's a miracle that I am saved. It's a miracle that I am standing here. Amen? I was the one in the bars drinking 151 and Coke. I was the one chasing women. I was the one that was a liar. But God, this is the power of God, that he calls those things which were low. He calls those people that were despised, that had no thought about them, and he changes them, and he cleans them up, and he puts their feet upon a rock, amen? That is the power of God. We are all living epistles and testaments to God's great glory. Amen? So that we would have no glory of our own is why that he calls us. Amen? We remember Brother Samson. The key to his strength was his hair. Not his muscles. Not his might. Because you know what happened when they cut his hair? His muscles were still there. His muscles didn't disappear when they cut his hair, but his strength did. And you might think, well, that's foolish. How in the world is somebody going to be made strong just because of their hair? Why? Because God chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. Amen? John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. God is not looking for us to use our own strength, and that's the great myth. That's the great lie in, uh, in the church today is that we've got to be strong in and of ourselves, that we've got to always have it all together. That's a lie. The truth is we've got to always have it broken so that God can always be in the midst of us being our strength. So we should never have it together in the sense of our own mind and in this flesh. But God, is he draws nigh to those that are of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. So when you stay broken, when I say broken, I don't mean handicapped. There's a difference between being broken and bring, being handicapped. Being broken is God. My sins are ever before me. And Lord, if it wasn't for you, I would be lost, God. I am nothing. I humble myself to you. Get glory out of my life. I don't want to do anything that's not your will. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's what brokenness sounds like, that I don't have it together, but God, I need you desperately. Amen. God does not need your strength. John chapter 18, verses 10 and 11 say this. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then said Jesus unto Peter, put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? So he said, 
Put away your sword, Peter. I don't need your strength. And that's what God is telling us all today is to put away your swords. God doesn't need your strength for him to be strong. God needs your weakness, okay? Now look, when I preach, when I come out here and preach, it's not me at all. It's not Damien, and my dad will tell you that. From the very beginning, he felt that I wasn't ready until he saw God begin to use me, amen? So it's not, see, here's what our swords are. Our swords represent our ideas, our abilities, our will, our action, and we're trying to make things happen on our own, okay? But we are not to fight this battle. It's going to be the Lord's battle. So Jesus told Peter, look, Peter, put that thing away. If I needed help, if I needed help, I could call upon my father, and he would send legions of angels to deliver me. But what he told Peter was this, shall I not drink this cup that my father has put before me? It was necessary for him to do it. He didn't need human defense. He didn't need human strength. And that is the same testament to us, amen, that God doesn't need our human ability. Well, I've got a degree in this. What can I do for you, God? Or I'm good at this. What can I do for you, God? No. I don't want to use you in your areas of strength. I want to use you in your areas of weakness. Amen? James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10 say this. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. I never asked to be the pastor of this church, okay? There was one day my dad came to my door, sent by God, knocked on the door. We let him into the house. He sits us down and says, God has told me that it is time to pass the church to you, okay? I never ask for it. You know that, you that have been here for a long time. You know I wasn't going around having secret meetings saying, you know, we should, he getting, he's getting kind of old, you know. We should start thinking about the future, you know. All right, let's do that. Maybe you should say something to him, okay? That is not what I did at all. I stayed very low. If you ever want to be used by God, you've got to stay low. You've got to stay humble, you've got to stay broken, and you've got to serve well. Amen? In the end of time, we want to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But in order to hear that, we've got to be doing something well right now. You don't wait to get your act together until you're standing in front of Jesus at the end of time. You start right now, serving God well and being faithful to the call. Amen? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resist the proud, but give grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. All right? So stop what you're doing. Stop all this activity that you're doing under your own power, your own ideas. Stop all, stop all of that, okay? Because the enemy is attacking you. Here, listen to this. Listen very closely. The enemy is attacking your life, and you've got your sword out. And that's the worst position you can ever be in is fighting the enemy under your own power. So what we need to do is stop everything. Can everybody say stop? stop. Everybody take your sword. Put it up. Okay? Because so many of us, we're out there trying to find a job on our own, find a spouse on our own, do this on our own, do that on our own. Put the swords away. Put them away. Okay? It says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God, okay? So, okay, I'm submitting to you, God. And now it says, resist the devil. Whoa, 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 wait a minute, God. You want me to resist the devil, but you just told me to put my sword away. How am I going to fight the devil now? It's not under your own power. We must first submit ourselves, therefore, to God, okay, and then resist the devil. But, but I'm powerless if I put my sword away. No, you're not. Once you have submitted yourself to God, he represents you in all matters. He represents you in all battles, in all fights, in all struggles. Once you've submitted yourself to God, because it says submit, then resist, and then it says, and then the devil will do what? Flee from you. 
Draw nigh to God, come close to God, and he will come close to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted. What? Be afflicted and mourn. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You want me afflicted and you want, it, and you want me mourning and weep. What? Wait, now this is getting confusing, God. You desire that I be afflicted. 